thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, as Professor Dirsch said, I'm enrolled in the History of Mathematics seminar, and this was kind of my project for the class. So really this is the culmination of just a couple of months of research on Bayes' theorem. I, I mostly just uh, read some books, watched some YouTube videos uh, to get most of the knowledge from here. So I'm by no means an expert on Bayes' theorem, but I've definitely learned a lot in the last couple of months and definitely have something interesting to share with you guys. So um, the first thing I just want to talk about is uh, Bayes' theorem is really, it's really becoming more of a big thing more recently. So Sharon Birch McGrain, which is the author of one of the sources that I'm going to be uh, uh, talking a little bit about today, when she first wrote the book, she said that she did a Google search for the word Bayesian and only received less than 100,000 results. Uh, that was back in, I believe, um, 2005, 2006 maybe. Uh, then later, I caught her on a talk on YouTube where she said in 2010 or 2011 that she did a, a search for Bayesian and received over 11 million results. And I just did a Google search yesterday, and I had uh, 42 million results. So Bayes' theorem is definitely something that's uh, getting bigger and bigger, especially in the last couple decades. And as we'll see throughout history, it was not always the most acceptable way to do statistics. So uh, I, ma I mainly use three different sources. I read these three books here. The first one is The Theory That Would Not Die by Sharon Birch McGrain. I use this book mostly for the historical aspect of Bayes' theorem, and uh, she talks about how it was developed and how it's been applied throughout history. Next, we have Proving History by Richard Carrier. He specifically uh, applies Bayes' theorem to uh, historical claims and claims of religion. And then Bayes' Rule by James V. Stone. This book is used, uh, I used to learn kind of more the mathematics behind Bayes' Rule and how to apply it with actual numbers. So this talk is going to be split into four different parts. First, just an introduction. What is Bayes' theorem? How do we use it? Uh, secondly, uh, development of Bayes' theorem. Who created it and for what? Next, the use throughout history. And finally, application, where we'll actually use the theorem. Uh, if I have time, I'll give a quick proof of the, of the theorem, and then we'll apply it with some actual numbers. So part one, introduction to Bayes' theorem. So I thought a good way to just kind of introduce this was to give a couple of quotes from some people who've talked a little bit about Bayes' theorem. First, we have Alan Kruger, who was the chair of President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors. He says that Bayes' theorem tells us how tightly we should hold on to our view and how much we should update our view based on the new information that's coming in. We intuitively use Bayes' rule every day. And that's kind of uh, what I've gotten a lot out of kind of the research is just that uh, even if you, you aren't applying Bayes' rule with the mathematics all the time, it's kind of a way to reason and a way to be rational. But, uh, and you can also, if you can come up with probabilities, throw those in an equation, come up, uh, kind of quantify uh, your beliefs and different things. Next, we have Sharon Birch McGrain, author of The Theory That Would Not Die. She says, we seem to be living in a dogmatic age, and Bayes tells us that it's all right to start off with a half-baked idea about a situation. The Reverend Thomas Bayes himself said to begin with a guess in the, in, in the absence of any information, assign it 50-50 odds. As we'll see, that's gotten a lot of controversy uh, throughout history. Uh, then she says, but then Bayes' rule commits us to modifying our initial ideas every single time a new piece of information appears. And that unrelenting commitment to changing our minds in the face of new knowledge appeals to me deeply. And then finally, we have John Maynard Keynes, who is an economist who also dabbled a little bit into probability and mathematics. He says, when the facts change, I change my opinion. What do you do, sir? So they're not specifically referencing Bayes' theorem, but definitely uh, referencing Bayesian type thinking, that when uh, we have new information or new facts, he's going to change his hypothesis or change the way he views the world. So now you might be wondering, what is Bayes' theorem? So just at the bare bones level, without actually showing you the actual equation yet, it takes our prior beliefs and then adds to that our, some recent objective evidence or information or data, and it allows us to come to a new and improved belief about the world uh, based on those two things. Sometimes it's called the probability of causes or often inverse probability. That's because with Bayes' theorem, we're oftentimes trying to go back to the original cause of some situation. So for example, uh, you may have a particular set of symptoms and those symptoms uh, would be 
uh, some data that you should be observing, and you might be interested in trying to figure out what was the cause of those symptoms, meaning uh, what disease or sickness originally caused those uh, symptoms. Uh, I just want to briefly talk about Bayesian versus, versus fr frequentist probability. This could be an entire lecture. These are two different ways of talking about probability in general. So if you were to take a statistics or probability class, uh, usually you would be thinking mostly in frequentist probability. So if you do confidence intervals or hypothesis tests, those are mostly built on frequentist principles, meaning uh, thinking of probability as the long run frequency of events. So for example, if we were to flip a coin many, many times, we would expect that 50% of the time we would have heads and 50% of the time we'd have tails as long as the coin was, um, was fair. Now, Bayesian probability isn't necessarily based on frequencies. It says sometimes we don't have those frequencies and sometimes we have to base our probabilities based on um, just some other data or kind of our, our background knowledge. And it's thinking of probability more as uh, what our beliefs are and how, uh, to what extent do we hold uh, different beliefs with what probabilities. And then finally, Bayes' theorem is valid. And by that, I mean it is a, uh, it is a valid way of reasoning, meaning that as long as the information that you throw into Bayes' theorem, meaning the actual numbers, are sound or are agreed upon, then that means the result of Bayes' theorem will also elaborate that in a little bit. I do mean it in the philosophical sense, so in the, in the same sense of, as a uh, valid syllogism, which you might see in a philosophy 101 class. So for example, we could have premise one, that all men are mortal, premise two, Socrates is a man, and therefore from those two premises, the conclusion would follow that Socrates is mortal. Since Socrates is a man and all men are mortal, he's part of that, uh, he's a subset of all of those men, that it therefore follows that Socrates is also a mortal or is mortal. So Bayes' theorem is the similar kind of logic to this. So you'll, you'll plug in numbers into the equation and then you'll get a, a conclusion, kind of like this. And just for fun, I wanted to share an invalid syllogism. So premise one, all dogs love food. Secondly, Socrates loves food. Conclusion, Socrates is a dog. Can anyone see the problem in this syllogism? The problem uh, obviously lies in that nowhere in the premises does it say that dogs are the only creatures that love food. Socrates could be a human or a cat or some other creature that also loves food. So therefore, this is not a valid syllogism. So this is the type of reasoning that Bayes' theorem does not fall victim to. <laughs> could be a dog too, yeah. Definitely could be. All right, so, so you might be wondering, then what are the premises of Bayes' theorem? If, if we need to think of the premises and make sure those are true when we're plugging them in, what are the premises? Well, there are three premises that you need to put into Bayes' theorem and three probabilities you need to be able to come up with. So the first one is the prior probability of the event or hypothesis. So just based on your background knowledge, how likely or how, how typical is this hypothesis? That's often, oftentimes the most difficult part to come up with. The next one is the likelihood of the hypothesis under the evidence. Does this new piece of information that we've discovered fit my theory very well? So if it fit it very well, we'd assign the likelihood to be a high probability. If it didn't fit my theory, their theory very well, then we'd assign it a low probability. We also need to know the likelihood of all competing hypotheses under the evidence. Does the new information fit an alternative theory better than my theory? And one common misconception is that those two likelihoods have to add up to 100%. They don't have to add up to 100%. They're not complements. They're uh, they're not actually related to each other. So just to give a quick example, just to see how, um, how we can define those, those premises without actually going through the actual mathematics, uh, I just came up with a quick example about uh, chicken pox. So these are not uh, real numbers, I just made these up. So first, the probability of getting chicken pox in here, let's just say that's 3%. So that would be the prior probability of getting chicken pox. Just based on our background knowledge and the population, the probability of getting chicken pox is 3%. Secondly, the probability of chickenpox rash, meaning the spots that you get when you have chickenpox, given that a patient has chickenpox. So let's say that's 99%. So under the chickenpox hypothesis, assuming that uh, someone did have uh, chickenpox, we could expect 99% of the time we would see uh, this rash. So maybe sometimes they don't actually show that rash. And then also we need the probability of chickenpox rash given that the patient does not have chickenpox and 
I put that at 0.01%. So maybe for some reason, someone who doesn't actually have chickenpox shows some spots on their skin that kind of look like chickenpox, and I'm saying that happens in the population about 0.01% of the time. So if you took those three premises, put them all through Bayes' theorem, then you would output the probability that a patient with the chickenpox rash actually has chickenpox, we would rate that at 99.7% given those three pieces of data. Okay, so that ends part one, and now we'll move on to the development of Bayes' theorem. So this is specifically uh, how it was formulated and by who through history. So first we'll talk about Thomas Bayes himself. Uh, Thomas Bayes lived in the 18th century from 1702 to 1761. That picture that we have there on the right may or may not actually be of Bayes. Some argue that it seems to be from maybe a later time period that maybe they didn't dress that way in the 1700s. So we're not really sure if that's him or not, but nevertheless, that's the picture that we're left with for Bayes. So a mathy minister, yes. So he was a minister. He was a Presbyterian minister who was also very interested in mathematics. Uh, he only had one mathematical publication in his lifetime and that was actually a defense of Newton's calculus after it had been uh, attacked by George Berkeley. And actually, after he had defended uh, Newton, the other supporters of Newton uh, voted him into the Royal Society of London, which was a, um, mostly a society for amateur mathematicians who were uh, interested in discussing mathematics and putting up their own ideas. So he would uh, bring his own ideas to that uh, um, to that uh, Royal Society, and Bayes' theorem was one of the ideas that he brought forward. So the biggest thing that stuck with Thomas Bayes was the idea of equal priors in the, uh, the Bayes' analysis. Remember, one of the premises of Bayes' theorem was that you had to have an e uh, a prior probability. Well, Bayes would say, well, if you don't know the prior probability, you can just make a guess. Or if you don't want to guess, then you can just assume there's a 50% chance of it being true and a 50% chance of being false. And lots of people thought this was not a good idea, and this was very subjective, and how could you bring this into mathematics? But nevertheless, uh, that was his idea. And basically, his reasoning was, Bayes' theorem is kind of a process, something you will run many, many times. So uh, as long as you keep filtering more and more information, that it won't really matter if your original prior probability was not uh, maybe the most accurate. Uh, eventually, it will be washed away with the new evidence. So Bayes did, did not actually ever publish on Bayes' theorem. Like I said, he did discuss it with the Royal Society of London, but he never actually uh, published his paper, although he did write about it. After he died, Richard Price, which was another minister who was one of his friends, went through Bayes' papers, found Bayes' theorem, uh, kind of worked on it a little bit more, and then he published it um, under Bayes' name. So he wasn't trying to plagiarize or try to take it as his own. Um, but the difference was Richard Price specifically wanted to apply, apply Bayes' theorem to the existence of God. So he thought he could prove the existence of God using Bayes' theorem, which is not something that Thomas Bayes had done. And uh, throughout history, other people have tried to apply it for the same thing. So there are some modern philosophers that like, think they can apply it to um, the existence of God. And some people fight that it, say that it, it proves God, and some people say it doesn't prove God. I'm really not going to go into too much detail on that, but just know that's... That's one possible uh, application of Bayes' theorem. So moving on to Pierre-Simone Laplace. So Pierre-Simone Laplace was a, who was Laplace? Laplace was uh, also a mathematician. He was a physicist and an, an astronomer. He was much more, much of a bigger name in mathematics than uh, Bayes was. Bayes is really much a minor, theor a, minor, a minor figure and is really only remembered for his theorem. Laplace is remembered for so many different things. And Bayes' theorem is just one of those things. And it's probably, definitely not the, the biggest thing he's remembered for. But uh, nevertheless, he did do a lot of work on uh, Bayes' theorem. So some claim that it should be called Laplace's theorem instead of Bayes' theorem because he did so much work on Bayes' theorem. Although he was not, uh, he was a little bit after uh, Thomas Bayes. I think it was about 17 years after Bayes had originally written his paper, uh, Laplace started thinking about it. Um, and Thomas too, so uh, Laplace would not have known who Bayes was, at least initially, until later Richard Price learned that Laplace was kind of working with something similar to uh, Bayes' theorem. And then he, said, then he sent a uh, Bayes paper to Laplace, which Laplace thought was interesting, and he kind of updated his own views uh, based on um, some things that Bayes had put forward. <coughs> 
So Laplace, unlike uh, Bayes, didn't Bayes didn't really suggest where we should apply uh, Bayes' theorem very much. Besides his, he kind of had some idea of uh, something kind of similar to playing pool, where you're throwing balls and you can try to figure out where the ball is on a table. But he never really gave any uh, concrete applications of Bayes' theorem. Laplace actually used it a little bit. So he specifically used it, I guess the most controvo controversial case where he used it was in court cases. So he used Bayes' theorem to try to argue that uh, there was a very high chance of uh, wrongly accusing someone of their crime, especially in cases of capital punishment. So he argued uh, a stance which was pretty radical at the day that we should abolish the death penalty because there's a high probability of uh, convicting someone wrongly and we wouldn't want to kill someone who was innocent. Um, and of course, you get criticism for that because everyone gets criticism for using Bayes' rule initially. Um, no one really liked it right away. And even Laplace himself, uh, later in his life, he kind of stopped using Bayes' theorem and he moved on to more frequentist methods. So it kind of mostly died with Laplace and uh, wasn't really taught in universities for the longest time. And uh, it was kind of frowned upon by many statisticians for the longest time, especially people like Ronald, Ronald Fisher, who was one of the, uh, the main proponents of uh, frequentist um, probability, who developed most of the uh, statistics that you would you'd see today if you took an intro stats class. Most of the stuff we do in there is uh, Ronald Fisher. And Ronald Fisher was like totally against Bayes' theorem, which really just helped to like minimize it throughout history. But nevertheless, it was used many times throughout US history to solve some really unique problems. So that moves us on to part three, where I'm going to share uh, three unique applications of Bayes' theorem throughout history. So the first one is the Federalist Papers. So if you're not familiar with the Federalist Papers, you've probably heard of them. They were a group of papers written by uh, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay in the 1700s in order to pr promote the Constitution. Uh, they were uh, initially anonymously written, and um, we were later able to discover who had written all of the papers except for 12, um, to which we had narrowed it down to either between Alexander, Alexander Hamilton or James Madison. But the problem was they had very similar uh, writing styles. So it was really difficult to tell who had, uh, who had written those papers. Um, so we come to Frederick Mosteller, which recognized this problem. He was a statistician who worked at Harvard, who had previously worked on polling statistics. And he thought, well, maybe I can give a shot at this problem of these papers, and maybe I can apply statistics and Bayes' theorem to actually solve this problem. So the data. So he had access to 94,000 words that were definitely written by Alexander Hamilton and 114,000 words that were definitely written by Madison. And he was uh, trying to analyze the word choice, hoping that one author would use certain words more than others. And he would ignore substantive words such as things like war or executive or legislator because those words would change based on the subject and either author could use those words. And he focused on other words such as in, and, of, upon, or other context-free words. One of the big ones was that we knew that, uh, or he knew that Madison used the word whilst and Hamilton used the word while. So that kind of helped him try to figure out who had used each one. So the process, so initially, he would assign each of the, federal, the Federalist papers that we didn't know who had offered them with a 50-50 chance of being written by uh, Madison or Hamilton. So the, here comes the initial prior of 50% that Bayes had put forward. And then he would update the probabilities uh, in 30-word 30, 30 snippets. So he'd look at the first 30 words of the paper, and he'd say, OK, what were the word choice in these first 30 words? It's like, oh, they used uh, while. So then I'm going to change my probability. Now it's 51 and 49. And now let's analyze the next 30 words. And then we'd update again until he made it through the entire paper. And then he'd have a final probability for each of the authors. So the equipment, I thought this was pretty funny. Uh, it, it was said that Masseller was initially armed with a slide rule, a typewriter, a 10-key adding machine, and a calculator that could multiply and divide when he started working on the Federalist Papers. Uh, this was back in 19, the 1950s. And he quickly learned. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, still using slide rules, apparently. But uh, he quickly learned that this was uh, not going to be enough to do the job. 
Uh, he worked at Harvard, which surprisingly at the time did not have, did not own their own computers. So he was able to get his hands on a computer that could do some programming. He used a program, a computer program, which I believe is still around, around called Fortran. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> and he employed a um, 100 helpers, mostly Harvard students, to help him input the data into the computers and run his analysis. So the final conclusion, surprisingly, the conclusion was that Madison wrote all 12 of the papers of unknown authorship with the lowest probability in his favor of 240 to 1. So I thought that was pretty surprising. Uh, one thing I did forget to mention was that um, both Madison and Hamilton had supposedly claimed they had written these 12 papers. So that's really what had made, made this a problem. Like they both said they wrote it. So like, okay, who do we trust? So apparently Madison was the one um, telling the truth there. So I don't know, I just thought this was a really cool case of mathematics hitting the real world and a, a great application to Bayes' theorem to solve a real problem, so. <laughs> yes. So um, it's, it was, it's been said that Frederick Mosteller spent more time working with these papers than the Founding Fathers actually spent writing the papers in the first place, believe it or not. I'm not sure exactly how many hours that is, but it was definitely a very huge task. Like I said, took over 100 helpers from Harvard, so it was, it was huge. It really was huge, especially with the uh, technology he had. All right, moving on to the Enigma Code in World War II. So, as you may be familiar with, um, Germany in World War II used uh, coded messages to send to their Navy and different military personnel throughout the war. And these messages could be intercepted by the enemies, enemies being America, Poland, and the British. But the problem was they, the letters were all scrambled up. So we were not able to know what they, what they said. The way that you would unscramble them was by use of a machine which was called the Enigma machine. And that's a picture of the Enigma machine there on the bottom right. And it kind of looks like a typewriter. You would have uh, basically your whole keyboard on there. And when you typed a letter, it would light up a bulb with uh, a letter that was supposedly supposed to be the decoded message. And, oops. okay, so the problem was that there was just so many different ways to set this machine that uh, it was, the, the Germans basically thought that the code was unbreakable. So, so specifically, there were, and can anyone tell me what that number is? No? 158 quintillion, 962 quadrillion, 555 trillion, 217 billion, 826 million, 360,000 different ways you could potentially set one of these Enigma machines. And if you're interested in where that number comes from, just do a YouTube search for number file and Enigma machine and they calculate it. It's a pretty interesting combinatorics problem if you're interested in learning about where that number came through. So, According to Professor Dirsch, even our modern computers could not brute force go through and check that many di different settings on a machine. So it wasn't gonna work to just check them all, that we had to somehow uh, find a better way. So in comes Alan Turing and uh, Bletchley Park. So Bletchley Park was a town or a castle or a mansion, I've heard it described as different things, in Great Britain around the time of World War II, where as many as 9,000 workers worked on trying to break the Enigma code. And initially, uh, they were not even employing mathematicians. It was like crossword puzzle solvers or linguists. And eventually, they started employing a couple of mathematicians to which Alan Turing was one of them. And he was really the genius behind going through and trying to break this code. Oops. So you might be wondering, how was Germany able to decode the messages? Well, the code would change every day. So the, er, the setting that you would have to set the Enigma machines to would change every day. Uh, so you'd have to change your settings um, to the correct setting in order to decode the messages. And Germany would pass out these code sheets which would tell you what setting to put the machine on. And so basically if you had this code sheet, you would be able to decode the Enigma machine. And occasionally we would actually get our hands on one of these code sheets and be able to decode the Enigma for a while. But the problem was they just didn't last. They were only good for a couple of weeks or maybe a month. And then there would be a new set of code sheets. And Germany was smart about it in that they wrote the sheets in soluble ink so that if they got wet 
meaning maybe you sunk a U-boat uh, and were able to get inside, uh, any of the code sheets would be uh, basically lost. All the ink would be washed away, so you could not, uh, you could not read it. Okay, so the, the way we were able to kind of decrease the number of ways to check the machine, we, we I mean Alan Turing really, was really through um, these weather reports that uh, Germany would send out every day. So Germany would send out a weather report which had a fairly standard form. So it always start out, you know, weather report, uh, the date, and then the specific weather for the day, and then the end, Heil Hitler. So uh, since we were able to uh, decode some of the messages with the code sheets, we knew what some of the mes messages said. Uh, so we were able to go through and say, all right, we know this weather report is sent out each day, and we know some of the words that are in every single one of these, um, every single one of these weather report messages. So we could bias our search on the Enigma machines to try to search for code that would decode the weather reports uh, with greater accuracy. So that made it so we didn't have to check nearly as many as 158 quintillion options. And the other, the other uh, part that contributed to uh, reducing those options was what's called the Enigma's fatal flaw. And that's that um, no letter in the code could code to um, the same letter in the actual message. So for example, if, you, uh, if, if the coded message had a W, then that means the decoded message was not a W. And that was actually able to uh, rule out many, many different uh, possibilities. So Alan Turing, being the genius that he was, was able to uh, incorporate uh, those things and some other things in order to basically reduce the number of ways that he had to check. He still went through uh, brute force and having to check just uh, millions of different combinations, but it was much less uh, than that number. So his process was called Turingery, which, uh, believe it or not, he used the prior odds again of the 50-50 starting spot. So he would make a guess on the, the settings for the machine and he'd say, let's just assume there's a 50% chance this is the correct setting. And then he would update that uh, based on information like the weather reports and whether or not it would decode uh, certain words. And he'd do this with a machine that he had created called the BOMB, B-O-M-B-E. So we actually had uh, many of these bombs all going all at the same time, just checking, 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 tons of these. If you've seen the movie The Imitation Game, you know what I mean, because they have all these machines just going and going and going until one of them stops and there you go, it's found the code. So the aftermath, Eventually, we were able to, we again, I mean, Alan Turing was able to break the code, and uh, he was able to break it each day in under 20 minutes using his machines. Uh, this created actually a new problem once we had bro broken the code in that we had to keep it a secret. We couldn't let Germany know that we'd broken the code because if they knew we broke the code, then they'd just change it, and we didn't want that to happen. So there were many times when we had information that we kind of had to keep secret. We couldn't act on some information. Like maybe they, they were going to invade this certain town at this time, and we couldn't act on it because it would be too obvious that we knew the code. So many lives had to be sacrificed just to keep this secret and to be only able to use it at the perfect times. Unfortunately, um, the Bayesian uh, thought process that went through to uh, decrack this code really never, it, Bayes' theorem really never got its credit until much later because uh, this was all classified for many decades after the war. I don't think it was until the 70s that it really came out, uh, this whole story of Alan Turing and how Bayes' theorem had helped do this. So unfortunately, that uh, contributed to Bayes' rule uh, still not having very much support. All right, moving on to the final application of Bayes' theorem, and this is history. This is Richard Carrier. Richard Carrier is an ancient historian, specifically interested in um, religion, which I'm not really gonna talk that much about religion today, just about the claims of history. And he thinks that we should bring Bayes' theorem into all claims of history. He thinks that basically the historical method and the way we think about history can all be described by Bayes' theorem. So for example, there are many, um, many things in history that just we are not that certain about. Uh, sometimes we don't have very good documentation, especially for uh, very old sources. Uh, sometimes the sources have bias because maybe they're part of uh, the winning side of a war, so we might uh, be more or less likely to trust them. So Richard Carrier would come along and say, well, why don't we try to quantify this? Why don't we try to, um, why don't we try to use Bayes' theorem to try to uh, 
put in some actual numbers here and say how certain we are about any historical claim. So one example, it's not an example that he used, but just something that I thought of is uh, the Trojan War in, you know, in Greek history. In ancient, Greek, in ancient Greece, the Trojan War is a war that we don't know if it really happened or not. It was written about in the Iliad and the Odyssey, but it's kind of something of legend. Well, Richard Carrier might argue that, well, if we can kind of try to quantify this, maybe we can come up with a percent uh, probability that this happened. And wouldn't that be better than just saying maybe it happened or maybe it didn't happen? And of course, many people th say, you can't do that, that's subjective. You can't use Bayes' theorem like that. And he'd say, well, why not? <laughs> and he claims not only history, we can use it for any everyday life claim. So let's say your friend comes up to you today and says, I was struck by lightning five times in my life. You might say, there, there's no way that happened. Well, that would inherently, uh, you'd be showing your low, uh, pr your, your estimate of a low, low prior probability right there. So maybe you should assign a low prior probability to that, uh, to that claim. But then maybe he supports that with some new evidence. Maybe he's got some medical records that show he was in the, in the doctor's office with, for uh, lightning strike care or whatever. So then you might be a little bit more likely to uh, believe his claim, but you still might be skeptical because he could have came up with that. So uh, I want to read. I want to read a quote from Richard Carrier and um, how he describes how we should kind of think about some of this stuff. So he says, "You may be hesitant to assign probabilities because it seems arbitrary and subjective, but the point is to translate your actual beliefs into a more convenient language. You already have those beliefs." So translating them into numbers does not make them any more arbitrary and subjective than they already are. And they are rarely as subjective as you might think. When you say a claim is plausible, you're saying that it has a high enough probability to consider it. When you say it's implausible, you're saying that it, ha that it has a prior probability low enough to dismiss it. Whenever you say one theory explains the evidence better than another, you are saying it has a higher consequent probability than another, and so on. All these statements will entail numerical equivalents, which are often objectively reasonable. So going on from there, to make it uh, even more conservative, I guess you would say, is we can do something called arguing a fortiori. I think that's how you say that. And that would mean um, arguing from the stronger. And uh, take, for example, maybe someone has asked, what do you think the probability that uh, we are going to be struck by a meteor sometime in the next year of the same magnitude of the one that destroyed the dinosaurs. And you might say, how am I supposed to know what that probability is? Well, you could ask some leading scientists to try to get an idea of what it is, but certainly that number is less than 1 in 100. I don't think there would be too much controversy of that. So then you can use Bayes' theorem and you can plug in a number like that. So you can say, okay, I know the probability is less than this. So then you can plug in Bayes' theorem less than this number, and then therefore the conclusion of Bayes' theorem would be less than this number. So you plug in less than x and you get less than y. And you can also do this for ranges of probabilities. So let's say you thought it was something was between 20 and 50%. So you could run Bayes' theorem using 20%, you could run Bayes' theorem using 50%, and then you kind of have something kind of like a confidence interval. You think that the actual consequent probability is between these two values. So Carrier gives us this conversion sheet, which he thinks we can try to translate our degrees of certainty into actual probabilities. So given any claim, you should be able to rank it somewhere along this continuum of a degree of certainty. So if you think something is virtually impossible, well, maybe that means you think it's about a one in a million chance of happening. So we can assign that a 0.0001% chance. If you think something is very probable, maybe you think that's about 95% chance. So any claim that you have, you should be able to fit somewhere along the spectrum, he said, and then convert that into a probability that you could use for Bayes' theorem. Now, he doesn't argue that these are the be-all and end-all numbers. For example, he gives, the, he gives the example of, well, you think that uh, getting in a car crash today is very unlikely, or ex you think that's extremely improbable, but you don't think that's 1 in 100, because otherwise you'd be getting in a car accident, you know, once a month or something, right? So it kind of changes, it could change based on the context, but this is just kind of a starting point to kind of go with things. And still people will, of course, come and say, well, this is, you know, subject, this is subjective. You can't do this with math and you can't do this with science. And you say, well, with historical claims, what you need to do is you need to get, you know, the leading experts 
in a room together, and they need to duke out these probabilities. They need to say um, that you know either the Trojan War happened or it didn't happen, and we can assign probabilities to these, and you can you can argue them, you know, and they can try to come out with one number that they agree upon. And if they don't agree upon a number, then it's up to the public to decide and other experts to decide who's giving the more rational argument. So, my thoughts on this is, I think that you can give this more as maybe a, I, 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 obviously it's, it's always going to entail some amount of subjectivity in historical claims. But I do think that if someone puts up a good argument for something and, some, and, someone, and you might agree with their argument, then just like I was saying originally, as long as the premise of, of Bayes' theorem, you agree with those, the conclusion will also follow. So I, I don't see any reason why this couldn't work in, in many situations. All right, finally part four, moving on to the application of Bayes' theorem. So the first thing I want to do is I just want to give a brief proof of Bayes' theorem, and that comes from the multiplication rule for dependent events. So really the only two events that we're interested in in Bayes' theorem are H, which is uh, that a claimed hypothesis is true, and E, that some new data or uh, evidence happens. So I'm going to write this on the board. So I'm just going to write up exactly what we have right here. So we have, we're starting with probability of, you know what, I'm actually not going to write both of those up there because they're just on the, they're on the screen. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the second one right there. If the probability that H and E happens, that's the hypothesis and the evidence happen together, it says that's equal to the probability of the evidence times the probability of the hypothesis given that the evidence happens. That line in the middle means given. So I'm going to write this, probability of H and E, that's equal to the probability of E times H given E, times the probability of H given E. Okay, so the thing that we're interested in Bayes' theorem is this part. We're interested in the probability of the hypothesis given that some piece of evidence occurred. So we want to isolate that part. So we would divide by the probability of E. So divide by probability E on both sides, probability of E, and that will cancel both of these. And then, so this is, maybe I'll write this, this is step one, we just did that. And now step two, I'm just gonna rewrite everything we have, I'm not sure if I'm gonna have a room here. Um, so now I'm just gonna rewrite this on the left hand side, probability of H given E, that's what we were trying to find, probability of H given E, given E, that's equal to the probability of um, H and E, probability of H and E, and that's divided by the probability of E. Okay, so that was part two, and now I'm going to move up over here. So this part right here, probability of H and E, if you look at the original uh, multiplication rule, I can substitute that with the very first part. So I'm just gonna rewrite the same thing, substituting this part. So I'm gonna write probability of H given E is equal to, now instead of writing this, I'm gonna write probability of H times probability of E given H. Oops, E given H, uh, H, there we go. And that is divided by the probability of E. Okay, so next is uh, maybe the trickiest part. Well, I, maybe I should say first, some people leave it here and they say this is Bayes' theorem. And actually on the, on the posters, you'll see that's basically where they left it for Bayes' theorem. But typically it's better to expand this, this part because typically you don't have the probability of just the evidence. You kind of have to find that and there's kind of a roundabout way to find that. And the best way to show that is by use of a tree diagram, how to expand this. So you know, two things could happen. One, your, your hypothesis could be true, so that's just H. Your hypothesis could be true or your hypothesis could be false, right? So I'm gonna denote, denote that by H prime like that. If your hypothesis is true, you could see some piece of evidence, so that's gonna be E, or you could not see that piece of evidence, so that's E prime. If the hypothesis is false, you could see some piece of evidence, or you could not see that piece of evidence, right? 
So it therefore follows that the probability of E could happen in two ways. It could happen here, if your hypothesis is true and the evidence happens, or if your hypothesis, oops, uh, sorry, if your hypothesis is false and the evidence happens. So then maybe I'm going to do, I'll write it, uh, maybe I'll write it, yeah, I'll just do this. Uh, so the way to find the probabilities given a tree like this is first you say, okay, I had to first take probability of H, that's right here, probability of H, and then I have to multiply that by the probability of E, but that's given that H already happened, so it's E given H. And then right here, um, this one is the probability of H prime uh, times the probability of E given H prime, like that. Okay, so maybe I'm gonna draw kind of like this. I think I could fit it in right here. So basically, these two parts together now are the probability of E. So maybe I will write that down here. Uh, I'll write that right here. So the probability of E, probability of E, and maybe I'm going to need a little bit more room. I'm going to go right here. So the probability of E is equal to, well, this part right here, probability of H times the probability of E given H, and then I have to add to that this part right here. Uh, this is, yeah, okay, I have double, yeah. And then I have to add to that the other part, plus the probability of H prime times the probability of E given H prime. Okay, so now we're almost done. All I have to do is just plug that in down over here. So this is gonna be step four, and it's gonna be the same thing that I see right there on the top. I'm not gonna rewrite this, I'm just gonna write this probability of H probability of E given H, and then I'm going to write divided by that right there, probability of H times the probability of E given H, uh, given H, plus the probability of H prime times the probability of E given H prime. And that's Bayes' theorem that, the, the version of Bayes' theorem that is the most expanded form, that the one that you really need to use when you're going through it. So now on the, on the screen there, you'll see the same formula. And I've kind of uh, split it up and put it down in the bottom just so you can see what each of those terms uh, represent. So first we have probability of H given E. That's the probability that our hypothesis is true given some piece of evidence. And that's equal to, well, the prior probability in favor of our, our hypothesis multiplied by how likely the data is if our hypothesis is true. And then you're basically just dividing that by the same thing, repeat above, still in red. And then we have to add to that the prior probability against our hypothesis multiplied by how likely the data is if our hypothesis is false. So finally, I just want to do a quick example here of actually plugging in some of the numbers to Bayes' theorem. And I think I'll just erase this right here. So once again, made up numbers on this one. It says, assume that 0.5% of men have prostate cancer. Further, suppose there is a test that has a 90% chance of correctly diagnosing someone who has prostate cancer and a 4% po uh, false positive rate. What is the probability a man has prostate cancer given that he has a positive test result? So the best thing to do first is just to you know, uh, define our variables. So one, I'm gonna do H with a subscript C. I'm gonna say that equals that someone has prostate cancer. Prostate cancer. And then I'm gonna do E sub P for the evidence of a positive test. So evidence, which is of a positive test. And then we can start to uh, define some of these things. So first, first thing they give us is 0.5% uh, of men have prostate cancer. That's the prior probability of uh, prostate cancer. That's just the probability of 
H sub C. That's equal to 0.5%, so that's 0 0.005. Next, further suppose there is a test that has a 90% chance of correctly diagnosing someone who has prostate cancer. So this is the probability of a positive test, which is E subscript P, um, given that they have uh, cancer, and that's equal to 90%. 0.9, and then um, it has a 4% false positive rate. So that is the probability of giving you a positive test, EP, uh, given that you actually don't have uh, cancer, and that's equal to 0 0.04. So there you go. Those are the three premises of, of Bayes' theorem. So first, uh, the prior probability of having prostate cancer, 0.5%. The likelihood, um, if the hypothesis is true, how likely would you get a, a positive test if you actually had cancer? Well, 90% of the time, if you didn't have uh, cancer, how likely would you get a positive result? That's 4%. So then we can um, plug everything into the formula. And I think I'm going to just erase this too because I might need some more room. So it might be useful to see the formula. So I need the probability of the hypothesis given the evidence. So I'm going to do that right here. Probability of the hypothesis given the evidence. I guess hypothesis sub C given the evidence of uh, prostate cancer. That's equal to, well, I need the probability of H, which is 0 0.005 times the probability of E given H, that's 0.9. You divide that by, well, the exact same thing, 0 0.005, 0 0.90. And then you add to that the probability uh, that, uh, of H prime. That's the probability that you don't have prostate cancer. That's just the complement of having, um, having uh, cancer. So if, this, if there's a 0.5% chance that you uh, do have cancer, that means there's a 99.5% chance that you don't. So that's 0.995, and that needs to be multiplied by probability of the evidence given the hypothesis is false, so that's 0 0.04. And if you do that, you'll get approximately 10%. So you might think, 10%, really? The probability that I have cancer given that I got a positive test is only 10%? Well, yeah, and you kind of have to think about what's going on here. There are so little people who actually have this disease. The, uh, it actually catches most of those people. The test actually catches though those people, but 99.5% of the people who take this test don't actually have the disease, and 4% of them are going to get a positive test. So that means if you get a positive test, there's actually not a very good chance that you're going to have the disease. And this is something that they have to watch out for with these with medical tests, because this, this is something that happens all the time. So what you would do is, well, maybe if you, if you got a positive test, maybe you would want to get a second opinion, and you would want to maybe go to a different doctor and get another test done. And if that were the case, and you were to apply Bayes' theorem again, what you would do is you'd take this 10%, and you'd plug that in where you put the prior probability the first time. That's the way Bayes' theorem is supposed to work. You're supposed to continually update when you have more information. So you get another test done and another test done. And let's say after three or four tests and you, they were all positive, then you could be confident, yes, I definitely have this, this disease. So I think if you plug it in a second time, you're, you're nearly 80%. And then the third time, you're basically 99% or so. So all right, I think that's everything. So does anyone have any questions about anything? Yeah. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Definitely. Right. I haven't looked into if it's used today for that. I didn't read anywhere. The only place I read about Bayes theorem for 
uh, criminal cases was for, from Laplace. And I have a feeling that uh, Sharon Birch McGrain would have mentioned it if it was something that was used, because she went into a lot of detail about um, many different applications of Bayes' theorem, and I, th I don't think she would have missed that. So I have a feeling that most likely not. But it's possible. <laughs> yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah. Laplace had some interesting assumptions that went into there, if you read about it. I think he said, like, he had some kind of arbitrary uh, degrees of belief about how truthful different people were. Like, he, he valued the truth value of a juror much higher than someone who was being convicted. So, and then some other things that went in there, which were kind of interesting to read about. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, I'd, I'd already uh, heard of different people talk about it. I'm, uh, I, uh, there's a couple of other uh, authors that have uh, written about it. Um, what, who was it? Uh, Sean Carroll has written about Bayes' theorem. He wrote a book called The Big Picture, where he basically argued that uh, Bayes' theorem, basically kind of a similar, similar thing to uh, Richard Carrier, that we should kind of, whether or not we're actually plugging numbers into the theorem, we should always be thinking in a Bayesian way and that if you have uh, some new, new piece of information, you should be updating um, your degree of belief in things. And I see people all the time, they, they, don't, they don't do that. They'll, they'll have like no, some new piece of information, they'll just say, well, that doesn't mean this conclusion. And I'm like, well, it should shift you some direction in that, in that way. And they're like, no, it shouldn't. It's like, well, <laughs> if you're being logical, I think, I think that is the rational thing to do. If you have some, some, uh, some evidence that makes one theory more probable, then you should kind of change the way you think, maybe even slightly, even if, that's not the position you adopt. So yeah, it was, it was, it was mostly I just had heard different people had talked about it. And I'm, I'm really interested in statistics. That's what I'm going to go to school for uh, next. I'm going to Western next semester for grad school in statistics. And I, they, I know they have a class there in Bayes' theorem, and I'm, I'm hoping to take that. So I just kind of wanted to get a, a head start and learn a little bit more about it. Like I said, I didn't really know too much right away, but definitely learned a lot. Um, the first book might have been William Lane, William Lane Craig's um, Reasonable Faith book, where he uses it to try to prove that the resurrection is uh, likely happened. And I thought that was pretty interesting. The disappointing part is he actually doesn't plug in any numbers. <laughs> he just kind of talks about it. And he uses that in his debates with atheists. He, I just thought it was so interesting. Like, really? You're using math? And he got, he's gotten criticism for it. Like um, uh, Bart Ehrman, one of the people who he, uh, he had debated, uh, basically said, what? You have a mathematical proof that God exists? Really? Like, you're going to pull that out? <laughs> and kind of mocked him for it. And I'm like, oh, maybe I should kind of look into this a little bit. So that might have been the first time I heard about it. But it came up with, uh, I don't know, Theodore, who's also in our math seminar class, had, uh, had brought up that he's heard a lot of uh, philosophers more recently have, uh, have talked about it, and he's heard about it there, too. Um, and I've heard the same thing. I've read a little bit of philosophy, and I've, I've heard it mentioned a couple times. So, yeah. For me, it was, uh, I was working at IBM, and uh, AIDS was just become a thing. Yeah, that's the big thing. That's the case where base theorem. That's the case where base theorem isn't that controversial, because it really just comes from. I mean, most of those things are 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 based on frequent frequencies. 
So you're not really putting any of your own beliefs or your own kind of uh, opinions into it at all. So. Yeah, we. I mean, even if the, even if the tests have a very very high accuracy, accuracy of the test, meaning they they basically catch catch almost everyone who has the disease, and they basically almost don't tell anyone who doesn't have the disease that they don't have it. Even if it's a very sl uh, small number, since these diseases are so improbable in the first place, you can get something like half the people who get positive tests don't actually have the disease. It's just like almost paradoxical. But that's the way it comes out when you run the numbers. It's pretty interesting. So, yeah. Thank you very All right. Much. Thank you, guys. Thanks for coming.